welcome to Independent Green Party, Green Party Green TV, the show dedicated to positive Green New Deal solutions and the independent candidates that advocate for them. I'm Gail Farrell Parker, your host for today. We have in our studio one Green Party candidate, um, Audrey Clement, is an independent from Arlington and for the Arlington Board of Supervisors. And we have Green Party candidate Natalie Lino Stracuzzi, the, the D.C. statehood Green Party candidate for U.S. Congress. And we have two other independent candidates, Julio Gracia, independent candidate for U.S. House, Virginia District 8, and yours truly, candidate for U.S. House, Virginia District 1. We will talk with each one individually and then have a quick roundtable discussion of the Green Party presidential ticket efforts. Independent Green Party Green TV is about Green Party New Deal eco jobs for the economy, positive Green Party solutions, Green Party eco capitalism. Prices must tell the environmental truth, the Green Party industrial revolutions, solar jobs. Wind jobs, geothermal jobs, rail jobs, weatherization jobs, conservation jobs, efficiency jobs, building green neighborhoods, walkable, bikeable, pedestrian, and rail friendly communities. Cut taxpayer subsidies to zero for fossil fuel, big oil, big auto. Rail built anywhere in America benefits all of America. Next up is Ms. Audrey Clement. But first, this message. The biggest way people give up power is by not knowing that we have it to start with. Well, we've got it, and we're going to use it. And it doesn't come from the big corporate political parties that are bought and paid for by Wall Street. Their choices are not our choices. Their candidates are not our candidates. Their economy is not our economy. Their government is not our government. Their prisons are not our prisons. Their police are not our police. And their endless wars are not our wars. And their recovery for the few is not our recovery. You've been a candidate for Arlington Board of Supervisors and uh, your former co-chair of the National Green Party. Uh, is yes. that correct? Yes, I am a longtime community activist, uh, a 12-year resident of Arlington, Virginia, and a graduate of the University of Pennsylvania. I also have a PhD in political science from Temple University. I devoted several years as a state and national Green Party leader, and I'm now committed to independent politics as the best way to achieve balanced government reforms. As a dedicated environmentalist and fiscal hawk, I actively promote fiscal responsibility, preservation of parks, green space, and affordable housing, renewable energy, more recycling, and local tax abatement. Could you tell us a little bit about how your campaign is going and the message that you would like uh, to get to your voters today? Well, I have, uh, as with most of my other campaigns, I have been uh, working aggressively. I have a very aggressive outreach effort going. I've been running Facebook ads for six months. I've been running online ads in uh, two Arlington newspapers. Uh, that would be InsideNova.com and um, Arl Now. 
I also uh, have distributed uh, approximately 25,000 pieces of literature. And I was out there walking the streets today dropping literature. And I also have um, yard signs in the medians in Arlington County. Yes, I saw your yard sign, which reminded me that you were a candidate. So th those are effective. Yes. Now, uh, I've also had several interviews with uh, various, uh, you know, with the Washington, uh, the Washington Post, uh, Inside Nova, Arl Now, Arlington Connection. Uh, these, uh, no irony in the fact uh, that uh, one party government dominates our county and uh, virtually all the districts, the electoral districts in the United States today, and they don't see any irony or any tyranny in that. So uh, it's been an uphill battle, uh, but I believe that someone's got to fight it, and I plan to continue fighting that battle, um, God willing, uh, for as long as I can. I, you're, you're a patriot, in my view. And we look forward to your discussion in the roundtable. Uh, next up, we have Natalie Linos Stracuzzi, D.C. statehood Green Party candidate for U.S. Congress. But first, we have a s short message. Eleanor Holmes Norton is a legend in the civil rights movement, but after 24 years as a district's delegate to Congress, the district still doesn't have a vote. She removed statehood from the Democratic Party platform, and the district is still not a state. We need a new vision for our city. Natale Lino Stracuzzi, a true champion for statehood and fair labor laws. Stracuzzi will fight for the issues that matter. Protect Social Security, a living wage, and equal pay. On November 8, cast your ballot for Stracuzzi for district delegate to Congress. Stracuzzi, and I approve this message. Lino's, so good to have you here today. Well, thank you for having me again. It's a pleasure to be here. Yes. Uh, tell us a little bit about your campaign and uh, why you, a little bit about yourself and why you're running for office. Well, I'm a mechanic by trade. I worked at Tisha BMW, Volvo, Washington, Metropolitan, Mercedes-Benz back in the day. I'm an independent sales rep in the furniture industry now. I basically run because I feel that the working class supports the world, not corporate America, and it should be our decision if we work till 70, not our government. In France, they voted out their president because they had to work till 62. Are we stupid? I see. I, I see. And uh, Natalie, oh, tell us a little bit about the message that you would got, like to get to the D.C. voters today. Well, I like to let them know that it's, it's about us and not them. Everything in this country is paid for by the taxpayer. Two-thirds state and federal, one-third private industry, and then they turn around and bend us over for it. I feel that these type of investments should pay higher dividends to our Social Security recipients, 100% of our health care, remand the fact that we have to work till 70, and then a child with a 3.7 to 4.0 grade point average should get a free ride on the taxpayer at a state or city university. That young mind may create that new return of energy, develop that cure, but if we put them there, we'll never find out, now will we? Have uh, you been uh, included in the candidate forums in your race? Just one. Next up, we have independent candidate, Mr. Julio Gracia, independent candidate for U.S. Congress in Virginia's 8th Congressional District. But before we talk with Julio, we have this brief message. I think the political system really sucks right now, and just getting a, a person with the right chromosomes, you know, with two X chromosomes, is not the solution. Hillary's agenda is not a woman's agenda. That's right. I mean, this is reality. Our faith is together, you know. We are on this small boat, you know, and that boat is not doing so well. Just putting a token woman into the White House is not going to do it, particularly when that token woman comes with the whole history of working for Walmart, whose agenda could be more harmful to the cause of women and children than Walmart that forces their employees onto public assistance and food support. A candidate who's been behind closed doors with Goldman Sachs and receiving hundreds of thousands of dollars in speakers' fees and who won't release the, the content of those speeches. The candidate who has yet to find a war that she didn't love, who led the charge on Libya, who supported the war in Iraq and only recanted on that, you know, what, like a decade later or so. This is not what women need for the way forward and it's not what society needs. We need a real public interest agenda with a public interest party. That's what my campaign is all about. Welcome, Julio. 
Oh, thank you. Thank you for having me here. Yes, uh, and I thank uh, not only you, but uh, all three of you for running for office. Uh, could you tell us a little bit about yourself and about why you're running for office? Sure. I'm originally from New York State. Uh, I graduated with a BA in psychology and a BA in psychology, in philosophy, sorry, and then a JD at Albany Law School. So uh, I've been living in Fairfax County. I became an FBI agent after law school, and I've been living in Fairfax County for 15 years. I was an FBI agent for 26 years, and a few years ago when they shut down the government, I had a thought that this is completely wrong. The government, the Congress particularly, does not know what it's doing. And that was perhaps the catalyst of what made me interested in running, and I decided to do it right after I retired last December. So I started to run early this year, getting the signatures for the petition and all that, and I was very well received. And so I'm still running until the election takes effect. And so the main reason I'm running is because I feel that a lot of the people we elect have nothing personally at stake in the decisions they're making. And I think a very uh, uh, simple example is the metro system itself. I think most congressmen never take the metro. Particularly congressmen in our district are not regular drivers, riders on the metro. I took the metro for 15 years as I commuted from Falls Church into Washington, D.C. at FBI headquarters and other assignments I had in D.C. So for 15 years, I took the metro, and I could tell you almost the time when it started to deteriorate. When I rode on one train, I saw, where do you grab on? I think they started to care less. Now all of a sudden, all of them are so interested in the metro, all the, 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 uh, the congressmen in the region are so interested in saving and all that, but you weren't there when it was breaking down, and you should have noticed that. Because, as I've said this before in other forums, is that there is a national security ingredient in the metro, and that is, that aspect is, that the nation is our capital. That's our national capital. D.C. is our national capital. And you need to be able to move people in and out, like on that fateful day of September 11, where people had to abandon their cars, people were scared. But that was the Metro's finest day of moving people to safety out of D.C. to their homes. Do you have a, a message that you would like to give to the viewers today? I, I think basically in essence is that, is that I am not fundraising. I think money is, is truly to some extent the source of all evil here in, in, in our government. And the reason I'm not fundraising is because I want to be indebted only to the people of District 8, our district. I don't want to owe money to anyone. In fact, I decided to try running as complete independent in the sense that I don't have a filter from any political party. This is my first time running, and I want to engage the people of our district on a one-to-one -one level. So I'm doing a lot, of, a lot of outreach. I'm meeting a lot of people. And when they get to know me, they, 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 I'm well received. Even their dogs like me. So you know, it, it's been a very good experience overall. Independent candidate on the ballot in Virginia's 8th Congressional District. Next, we have the roundtable discussion with all candidates. You're watching Green TV to Independent Green Party, Green Party Green TV. The show dedicated to positive Green New Deal solutions and the Independent Green Party, Green Party and independent candidates that advocate for them. And a first question for the candidates here, the, the two legacy parties succeeded in keeping the other national parties out of the debates. How do you feel about that, and what sh should the next course of action be for the two smaller national parties? Well, I'll be happy to take that question. Okay. First of all, uh, it is the case that um, the legacy parties did win round one this year, but round two is coming up. Uh, as a matter of fact, I just picked this off my smartphone today. Uh, there is a lawsuit pending against the Commission on Presidential Debates for locking out unjustly third-party candidates who have made ballot in dozens of states across the United States. Uh, this suit is, is the Level Playing Field lawsuit. Uh, Level Playing Field is a group uh, organized by Peter Ackerman, who formerly headed American Ele Americans Elect, which was a political party attempting to nominate a presidential candidate several years ago. Uh, the lawsuit charges that the Commission on Presidential Debates and its directors have violated federal election law that requires debate sponsors to be nonpartisan. 
and use objective criteria to determine which candidates will appear. The lead litigator on this case is a very impressive woman. Her name is Alexandra Shapiro, uh, and she was recently awarded uh, permission to deliver oral arguments uh, in, uh, in federal district court on January 17th. This is a phenomenal success because all prior lawsuits of this nature have been dismissed out of hand. Uh, so basically Shapiro has made it to first base. Uh, this is a signal achievement. Uh, I think she is going to, um, she is going to do well. Uh, she may even succeed in uh, winning this case. Uh, I believe this lady has a future ahead of her in any event. Yeah, she's very brilliant to have gotten this far. Uh, do you think that it could negate the election? Uh, no, I don't no. think it will do that, but it may govern uh, the, it may govern who can participate in future presidential debates. Ah. And this is extremely important. I know we're all, we've all been tied up in this uh, gruesome uh, presidential election of 2016, and most of us can't look, dread to even think of what's going to happen in 2020. Uh, but for the sake of our children, uh, we need to look forward, we need to look in the future, and uh, I, I'm very optimistic at this point. Right. And how about you, gentlemen? Do you have a, any input on this subject? Well, my point is, I mean, I, I like to know what her arguments are so I can evaluate the, the, the real merits of the case based on that. But I think that what's gonna hurt them in some ways are is that they do have regulations that you have to meet. You have to get about 6% of the vote to 15% of the vote to be included, inclusion in these forums. So I think that the rules though were made by the, the two bigger parties. So they have uh, more or less shut out uh, the, the next two big parties, the next two regular parties we have in the U.S. based on that. Uh, isn't it true, though, that they should select um, criteria that uh, will be a, a betterment and uh, result in a good outcome rather than something that is exclusive and suppresses democracy? Uh, uh, yeah, isn't the whole thing about democracy choice? And and there was one criteria that you mentioned in their decision is that if you're on the ballot, you're a bona fide candidate. It's not like you're, you you know, you went through a process to get on the ballot. We all went through some sort of process. I had to get a thousand signatures of, of a bona fide registered elect uh, of people who are ready to, to vote. And I got extras because I knew some of them would be invalid, but I got on the ballot. We're all, and they are as candidates for president, if they're on the ballot, that means they should have access to the same forums as other legacy party candidates do, because there is a support for them. And so what we end up, it's almost like being at the supermarket, you know, let's say Coke and Pepsi, they control the shelf space. So you'll never be able to sample any other soda You'll never know whether there's a better soda out there. And this is the marketplace of ideas. And it's, it's, and it's and what creates a cynicism for a process where you don't allow that marketplace to be free and fair because the marketplace of ideas really isn't fair or free right now. Yeah. Well, the, according to the CIA World Factbook, there are truly four national parties in the United States. But this year, there were some 25, 26 independent candidates on various states uh, as well. So what do you all think would be a good criteria? Uh, would it be national parties? Uh, how would that affect the independent parties? How do we get how do we decide, or what would be a, a, an acceptable solution to decide who gets into the debates? I think there's a screening process already. You got on the ballot. People don't realize how difficult it is to be on the ballot. So you're, you're saying that if an independent is on the ballot in enough states that they could be elected. Right. And you uh, could argue maybe should, be, should it be a third of the states or 20. We could argue about that, but I think that's the basic concept. If you got on the ballot, that should be the, 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 the screening process then at that point. Not, po not polls and stuff like that, and yeah. particularly polls from previous year that your party make certain amount last year. No. Well, the two larger parties make them. You, Audrey, you have? Yes. Uh, the general criteria, one of the criteria that already exists 
okay, that the Commission on Presidential Debates already accepts as one of its criteria is that the candidate achieve, achieve ballot in enough states to win a theoretical majority of the Electoral College. And this has been achieved uh, by both the Libertarians and the Greens uh, consecutively over the past, I don't know, 20, at least 15 years, okay, the last three or four election cycles. Uh, in addition to that, however, they require that the candidate poll at 15 percent. And this is an arbitrary number, and that is what is under dispute. Now, Level Playing Field has advocated for the, you know, it, it wants to retain the existing criteria that you have to get a theoretical majority in the Electoral College by, uh, by getting on the ballot in that number of states. Um, it's also indicated that uh, it would be willing to limit the debate to just one independent in addition to the partisan candidates in order to, uh, to make for a manageable forum. Um, however, under the existing, uh, sorry, under the existing, it is sufficiently difficult to make ballot in the United States today that it is unlikely that a forum would be crowded with more than four candidates, as things stand right now. I, I agree with you. I mean, I that, 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 is, that to me is bogus, because look at how many candidates, in one of the legacy parties, how many were there, like a dozen? And on that stage, you mean they couldn't have four? Yeah, okay, yeah, they couldn't have four? You know, this time around for the, uh, ah, come on, but sorry. Realistically, I so sorry. realistically, you have to look at the real facts for an independent to run for presidential office is one of the most difficult things to do. Why? Because you have to set up offices in each state because they have no ballot status for independents. Again, only parties can create a ballot status that puts them in the level they can automatically nominate from their convention their nominee. So as an independent, it makes no sense for them to run for president. It's great that they run for state and local offices in general, but when you look at it realistically, they don't have a chance as an independent to become president because it's, it's not cost effective. They have no ballot status. And to create their name, the, to create the position that their name would go on the ballot as a presidential candidate, it's just uncalled for. It would never happen. It can't happen because it's just too hard to do. That um, brings up another issue, Leno, that uh, each state has different requirements for federal office. In Virginia, candidates have to collect a thousand valid signatures. In some um, states, it's uh, two or three signatures they collect, or a dozen signatures. Some only have to pay a fee. I believe in Oklahoma, they only have to pay a fee. So uh, how do you feel about that? Is Does that get us, uh, does that system produce good candidates? Well, what should change? Okay, what I think you're talking about is the fact that elections are, are a function of state government, not the national government. There is no truly federal uh, system of elections. And that leads to wide disparities in the criteria for making ballot, and that in itself is unjust. Um, in other nations, other democracies, uh, the electoral process is governed by the the uh, the national government and so it makes for much more uniform election laws uh, but I believe that uh, Congress and the states would be very reluctant to change the current system uh, to a fully federal system because of the injustices inherent in the state level uh, if, if in fact we did adopt a federal system of elections whatever uh, injustices were embedded in that system would be virtually impossible to change or at least to uh, negotiate. Okay. Thank you. Uh, do we, we have a, a, just one time for a quick question. The two legacy parties have refused to remove federal leg legislation that subsidizes big oil, big asphalt, and big auto and places the burden on local communities to fund rail mass transit. Across the nation this year, voters will be considering more than $200 billion in local transportation-related ballot measure, measures. How much of an opportunity is this for Green Party and independent candidates on the down ballot? Do you all foresee that the voters will extract their pound of flesh by voting for Green Party and independent candidates over the two legacy parties? 
in this uh, coming election? I like to say that I think that the, it's it's happening in some ways because if you look at it, they wanted to build the uh, the new super trains right from Florida to D.C. and then New York, etc. And the money, if you look at Amtrak, they are funded, uh, subsidized by the federal government. And this is where we can get these type of programs and the type of funding needed to push this forward to another level. Because again, we just have to have the right people in office. They will put together the uh, the, the grants and the system that the states can. Uh, can, you know, can, that states can acquire by applying for it at that point. And again, so we are in some ways starting to do that with the super trains, but again, this is how, uh, uh, in, I think, for us in general. Mm -hmm. Well, right now, if a, a community or a municipal government wants to solve their transportation issues, the laws that the federal government that's been put in place and kept in place by the two legacy parties say to them, if you build roads, the federal taxpayers will pay 80%. If you build rail, the federal taxpayers will pay 20%. So this places the burden on the local communities to fund rail mass transit. Uh, so uh, we, in some view that the leveling of the playing field would be to at least um, uh, subsidize the rail mass transit at least as much as to do the polluting and the um, deadly roads and the toll roads. So uh, do you all, has that message gotten across to the voters, Audrey? Uh, unfortunately it has not. As a matter of fact, I just attended uh, a key hearing on widening Interstate 395 uh, in Northern Virginia, extending uh, hot lanes north from Edsel Road to uh, the 14th Street Bridge in Washington, D.C., and the hearing was packed with boosters uh, for road widening, including the construction union that uh, hired the workers that constructed toll lanes on 495, uh, taking up acres, if not miles, of natural uh, uh, wooded areas, uh, and also uh, the Chamber of Commerce of Fa Fairfax County, I believe, Chair uh, Chamber of Commerce and uh, other Chamber of Commerce spokespersons. Um, the people who argued against more road building, uh, and in this case, a very dangerous road that will take out the shoulder of one of the existing HOV lanes. And emergency routes. Yes. Uh, they were completely drowned out by the boosters uh, for uh, more roads. And there's no discussion of alternatives. In fact, the uh, environmental assessment that was prepared by VDOT uh, for this particular stretch of road only considered one alternative. It did not consider that, for example, uh, there is a rail that extends all the way from D.C. to Spotsylvania County. So I'm Gail Farrell Parker, producer of Independent Green Party, and that's all the time we have for today. Please join us again next time for Independent Green Party, Green Party Green TV.